Peter Rose along with currency trading. It's a cold late uh, April day, uh, 2022. That's the uh, flannel shirt. And a little coffee today. Thank you uh, for those who have uh, uh, commented on my <laughs> recovery from my my gastrointestinal viral infection that knocked me out for, for quite a while and put me on a bland diet and um, no coffee and stuff. So that's, uh, it's been a couple of weeks and uh, I gradually started back and um, at, with the coffee. And so I'm, I'm back enjoying a cup of coffee several times a day. So thank you for your, uh, for your encouragement and your thoughts. I appreciate that. <clears throat> Strategy versus rules uh, is what I want to discuss today. And, and drinking the coffee and the weather and the thing is uh, shirt because of the cold weather. That's all part of a, a strategy. You know, the strategy says that um, when you come down with uh, some kind of uh, illness that you take care of yourself. Now, some of the rules might be having a, a bland diet, for example, which is one of the one of the rules that I was given. Now, in my uh, particular instance, um, that bland diet had to include some other things that I wasn't uh, supposed to do. But the generic strategy of the intent of the advice was be very careful not to do stuff that would upset your, your stomach or your bowel or, you know, intestines or whatever. <clears throat> and so for the strategy that the emergency room doctor provided for me in giving me the bland dietary rules, he said, you know, in two or three days, you should start to feel better. And within a week, um, you should be pretty much back to normal. Well, in two or three days, I was still in a lot of pain. And it was two weeks before I really started to feel better. And so, was he expressing a strategy or was he expressing some rules? Well, there were a little of both. <clears throat> the rule was, um, if I was working or whatever, that within a week, I should be able to get back to that work. Now, that's a... A strategy. The strategy is take it easy until you feel better. The general rule on average is that with this kind of condition I should be able to get back to my normal functioning self in a week. But as it turned out I couldn't. And so do we blame the rule? Do we blame the strategy for the failure? You know, <clears throat> when I'm working with somebody in developing their trading, we got to really start from the beginning and develop um, a, strategy, a, a, a strategy for how to deal with each of the three phases of the life cycle of a, a currency position. You have your entry analysis, position management, and exit methodology. And so there are, um, the overlying strategy is to follow that the strategy of each phase is different because it's trying to work in a different problem domain or there's a different issue to solve. I mean, you're doing different things, different types of thinking if you're talking about um, entry analysis as opposed to exit methodology, for example. And so the strategies in each one of those phases are going to differ from each other, but they're all going to be supportive of the overall um, life cycle of that currency pair that you're going to go through. And so what we're really talking about is building a framework. The framework becomes rigid, that there's three phases to this currency pair, and that there will be strategies that are consistent with moving through the three phases and strategies or strategic analysis and, 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 and stuff that needs to be done within each individual phase that's going to be different from another phase, right? And so from those strategies, you develop these basic rules. Well, have a bland diet for four or five days. Um, 
you might have a similar rule in your trading. For example, if you're staging in, you might have a rule that says, well, once, uh, once position gets going on your initial entry point, then you wait for um, um, one ATR and then you add another lot or whatever, you double up whatever you went in with. Um, so that might be a rule. Now, if you were trading up on a daily chart, um, that rule wouldn't be waiting an, uh, an ATR to double your position, right? Because where's the guarantee that it's going to move uh, an ATR before it, it retracts or retraces? And so you'd want to get more stuff in the mix within that ATR so that if it starts, the price starts to chatter, you can say, well, I'm sitting here with with uh, with two lots, I'll pull one off and let the other one uh, float a little bit. But you got to remember, you're pulling off the first one because of FIFO rules. If you're in the United States, um, and let the other one run, or you could say, well, I'm just going to get out, and uh, if it retraces all the way back to my take point, <coughs> I'll get back in again. I'm not going to wait for it to go down and take in more lots as it goes uh, against me because it may continue to go against me. I, 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 you have to be careful there. So you see, I've, I've taken a general strategy, which is staging, and I've set for my particular time frame, which at that, in that particular example of uh, waiting 10 pips for, uh, before you stage in the, the first time, that you would um, wait 10 pips in order to do that. But I'm on a five minute time frame. So I'm all I'm doing is I'm waiting or a five a five minute time frame with a five period ATR, right? So I wait five pips and I stage uh, or ten pips and I stage a lot in. I'm waiting two ATR there actually. I could stage at five and five and five. You, you know, it just depends on well, where's the profit target? You know, if I'm shooting at a ten pip profit target, I'm probably not gonna be staging lots in. <laughs> because of the VIG, the, the spread between the bid and the ask is, uh, you know, a pip and a half. <laughs> so, I, you know, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be doing that. Um, but if my profit target is where I set it as a proportional to uh, the ATR, a profit target and the momentum of the, of the price, um, would characteristically for me and my rules that support a particular path through the strategy, calls for um, a need to have a 20 or 30 pip um, profit target in order to, to do things. Now, when I'm starting somebody out in their trading journey, we start with a $1,000 mini account and you trade that, you're all in, all out. There's no staging, no compounding, none of this stuff. Because if you can't trade one mini and be successful, you damn sure aren't going to be uh, trading successfully by staging. Staging doesn't do anything. It, all it does is add to the, to the chaos and crisis when the when the thing goes against you now i had a situation uh, yesterday where uh i had a, a position that i was staging into and um uh it it, it you know it, it worked out fine um and I, I made 500 bucks i'm in a, a position today where i staged in over a longer period of time because i had a longer uh, uh, atr it was uh, 300 dollars in my favor now it's slipped around and it's $400 against me because it's gone in the other direction. So uh, how far do you let that go? What are you looking for? I mean, those are other, other considerations. Although the strategy is to stage. That strategy has to consist of a bunch of decision nodes. If I do this, this could happen or that could happen. If this happens, this could happen or that could happen. And you, so, so you go down this matrix and each node is a rule. If this happens, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do this. And so you make that decision because if I go here, there's a rule that says if this happens, do this or this. So because the deeper you get into the into the trade, in other words, the longer the trade runs, the more decisions open up to you. It's like um, in a chess game. 
you know, when you make that th those initial movements, there's 600 and some odd possible responses to each move. Now, in the beginning, um, it's relatively easy to filter out uh, 649 of the 650 different decisions because they don't make any sense. But as you get deeper into the game, there are more potential paths that you go through. And so, for example, in a chess, in, the, in an opening theory, you say, oh, well, this guy did this, so he's probably setting up the castle on the queen side instead of the king side, and so therefore he's playing this pattern, and I have to respond in this way by moving my forces over to where the guy is castling <coughs> because I want to attack the castle. I don't want to attack the other side of the board. So the rule is attack the castle, but the execution of that rule is am I going to attack the castle on the king's side or am I going to uh, do it on the queen's side? And the methodologies for doing that are different because of the way the pieces move and stuff in chess. And in currency trading, it's basically the same thing. You know, if price is moving up and you know you don't have any resistance in front of you, then you can add to that position to see how far the momentum of the price will take you. But if you're price is moving toward a resistance point and it starts to chatter, you're going to be less likely to, um, to add to that, to, to that trade. So your decision at that point is, um, do I add, do I stay uh, where I am and see how far to go, or do I get out? So you have three nodes of action. Well, if I get out, this is what's going to happen. Well, I'm going to cash, and then do I have another entry opportunity, and where would that be? That, and that sort of thing. So you have to be really clear when you're setting up your framework for your own trading that you understand the difference between strategic thought process and analysis as opposed to the implementation of the various rules that may exist within the particular phase that the currency pair is in. That makes it sound really, really complicated, but it isn't. It's like driving a car. When you come up to a stop sign, there's something that you need to do that's different than when you come up to a stop light or when you just come up to a four-way cross, right? So it all sounds really complicated, but after you have solved the problem of coming up to the stop light four or five times, well, you know, if it's orange, you slow down and, and stop. If it's red, you stop, you know, whatever. If it's a stop sign, you stop. There's no question about that. But once you get used to that and you've done that scenario a few times, you're not thinking about, oh, I'm going to stop light versus a stop sign versus a, a four-way cross. You just don't need to consider that. It becomes, oh, this is a stop light. It's orange. I'm going to start to slow down. Okay? So what do you do to create that framework within your own methodology. A, a, a framework is a thing, and a methodology is how you implement that thing. And of course, um, the next thing is that you have to consider is the when. I always talk about the, the three questions that you have to ask yourself that set up <clears throat> the framework of building rules for that particular strategy. What are you going to do? How are you going to do it? And when are you going to do it? Any dumbass can, can know what to do. And 80% of the dumbasses can know how to do it. But there are only a few that know when to do that. And I really think that that's the reason that most traders fail, is they're, they're discounting the when in favor of, oh, I have all this complicated tactical shit that I have to employ, and I'm going to use my... Uh, Bollinger Bands in confluence with an RSI, and I've got uh, momentum to take into consideration. It's the third Tuesday of the month, and uh, the economic conditions in the pair countries are blah, 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 blah. You're just going crazy. You're just complicating things beyond reasonable expectation with shit that doesn't mean anything. So when you're looking at doing this on your own, I mean, you could do it with me. I, you know, I take you through. It's a three-month it's a three-month process with a lot of consulting and, and, and uh, 400 pages of manuals. Um, 
you might be able to get through it in a month. But it, it takes you through each particular phase and it answers the what, how, and the when questions as you go through with each particular um, book covering the what, the how, and the when, which is the um, going through the process of the three phases of the currency pair as to entry analysis, position management, and then exit methodology. That's what the three manuals go through, and it takes time. But all that stuff is organized for you. It builds a framework, it shows you the methodology, and it provides the strategy for each particular phase that you're trying to get through, and each strategy is linked to the one following it and the one behind it. That's the only way that it makes sense to do that. I can do that because I had a 33-year career as a software engineer building complex um, internet-based business applications, enterprise business applications. And so those are very, very, very complex problems. And so you have to say, well, yeah, all the shit in the middle is complicated, but what am I trying to do? Where am I trying to get to? Oh, I'm trying to get here. I'm trying to sell a pair of boots on the well, okay? <laughs> well, what are the steps somebody's going to have to go through in order to sell those boots? Well, they're going to have to be presented with a page welcoming you. This is a shop. We sell boots. Then we got to show them the catalog. And then we got to allow them to pick their sizes. And you know, you really go on through that. Each one of those is a major phase of the shopping experience. So you isolate that and you say, well, we got to show you the catalog, our catalog. Well, okay, so there's a whole, there's one object that controls everything around catalog, getting the catalog, displaying the catalog, ordering the, the, the products, letting the user select the ordering of the product sizes and all that other kind of shit that go with it. Um, and so you have this unit of work. So you solve that unit of work with a known input and known output that's simple. And that known output will go to the next module. So you're working on this module, solving a simple problem, show the catalog, okay? Now, once you get into show the catalog, there are probably eight or ten steps in order to do this, to do that. In um, um, agile programming, uh, we call them stories, and we, we'd sit down in a, in, a, in a group meeting and we'd lay out the week's uh, work and so I'd be working on this catalog thing and we sit around the team would sit around and say okay we're all working on this catalog thing what are the steps to get from the getting the catalog to the person selecting the, the thing that he wants what are those steps and there might be um, 10 steps to get through that so each one of us is assigned one of those steps because each step then has a whole bunch of stuff that needs to be done so you take that one step and you'd say okay these are the things that need to be accomplished in that one step and they're sequentially ordered and organized in that manner and so a, a solution to this little piece feeds the next little piece which is expecting that solution and that is going to produce another solution here, and that goes there. So it's a microcosm of a macrocosm where we're doing the same thing. It's um, fractal. It's it, it, that that's what you're trying to do in organizing a software engineering program, or solving physics problems, or mathematics problems, or imagine this: trading currencies. Now, it's a lot. It makes a lot more sense to do this in currencies than it does in trying to do it in the stock market, which is totally chaotic because everybody's screaming, oh, I think such and such a stock is going to go high and then I think it's going to go low. And, it's, and none of it's based on anything, based on news. It doesn't, nobody knows what's going to go on. And the only people that make any money on that really are the people that step back from the thing and go, well, I think such and such is going to happen. You know, uh, God, I forgot what his name is. Uh, One Up on Wall Street. Peter Lynch. Wonderful book. You know, uh, uh, one of the greatest fund managers ever, Fidelity. And, and he um, uh, was sitting around the house and he saw this little uh, 
egg-shaped thing. And his daughter had bought it. He goes, well, what's that? He goes, oh, they're, 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 um, uh, they're pantyhose. I forget what they call it. Legos or leg, legs or something. Legs or something. I forget what the product was. Anyway, so people buy that. The, 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 the hose and the, the thing. She goes, yeah, yeah. So he goes out to the different stores at the mall, and they're all selling this stuff. Oh, he comes back. He does some research on the company. He says, price is undervalued for what the potential of this is. My daughter is using this, all this stuff. We're going to go in and buy this. It was a huge winner. Um, there were a set of rules that he followed that took him from one conclusion to the next, to the next, to the next. And so when you're working through the solution set of your not only your framework and the methodology that, that the framework encompasses, but when you're solving these individual problems in each one of the phases of the life cycle of a currency pair, you have to, you have, to have some experience of what you're doing in order to know what the questions are to ask. If you don't have the correct education, you're not going to know what questions to ask. Those educators may be answering the question, but if you don't know that it's a question, you're not going to be paying attention to it. And because they don't know how to teach, many of them, it's out of the sequential order so that you can say, oh, I see, we're going from here, we're going here, and we're going to here. So look, when you're doing this stuff, don't listen to what anybody has to say because they don't know what they're talking about. They were successful more than likely because they did all those things naturally the right way, but they don't recognize exactly what it is that they did, and so they're saying that they did it based on Bollinger Bands or moving average crossovers, or whatever the, that they're talking about, but none of that is how they made their money. And if you have somebody that's fortunate enough to have a six-figure account that's trying to teach this stuff, they're certainly not teaching <laughs> the way that they made the money with these stupid risk to reward rules and 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 uh, only risk 1% of your account and uh, on any given trade and if you lose four in a row then you got to quit for the week it's just beyond comprehension there's no comprehension of statistics or probability analysis or the utilization of the law of large numbers none of that stuff Oh, they, they mention that stuff, but they really don't understand that. I have a degree in physics, you know, almost a minor in math. I think I understand a little bit about this stuff. So I'm cautioning you. Be very, very careful about the advice that you take. When I started out, I thought that the advice that they were giving was legitimate for the problem domain that we were trying to solve. When I got into real estate, I listened to the people that, were, that had bought buildings and were leasing them out and doing all kinds of stuff and that was the straight scoop and I learned from that and bought a building and guess what everything that they said that I needed to know I did because those people know what they're doing but currency traders don't they don't know what they're doing they got lucky so now they're not teaching you how to make money they're teaching you how to protect your money because that's what they're doing oh I got six figures I don't want to lose it because I don't know how I made it and so I'm going to have these stupid rules like I'm not going to lose more than a quarter of a percent or a half a percent on my account. I'm not going to do this and I'm not going to do that. That's not how you make money. That's how you keep from losing money. But it doesn't help your account grow. It's a very slow growth process. They can get away with that because, um, look, if you're trading with a $100,000 account, each pip move is 100 bucks. Make five pips, it's $500. I'm done. You know, there was a guy, um, God, what was his name? He was a, uh, a, a, a trader out of London. And uh, he started out, took $5,000, turned it to 11000 in, uh, I don't know, five, six months, and then took uh, a $400,000 um, uh, account. Uh, no, then he took... Um, yeah, took a four, took four hundred thousand dollars of bor borrowed money from the, their uh, grandparents. I guess death. He and his sister had inherited four hundred thousand. He took the four hundred thousand, and and turned it into, oh man, I forget what it was five one point eight million uh, in in eighteen months. And now he's teaching exactly that type of stuff. Um, you know, 
don't rich more than this and blah, 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 blah. He put $400,000 on the line and he didn't. <laughs> Just, it's, it's crazy. Strategy versus rules. The strategy is what you're supposed to be thinking about with various tones of how you're going to do that. Out of that strategy are going to come rules. But there isn't just one path of rules for that strategy. There are three or four paths depending on what happens. For example, as price is rising, if there's a, resi a resistance level there, I'm not going to want to add to the position. If there's no resistance there, am I going to want to sit with it or am I going to want to add to it? If I get out, when would I get back in or would I get back in? So each one of those questions has a solution set to it. But if you don't know enough, if nobody sat down and said, hey, look, this is how you look at this kind of problem. And these are the kinds of questions that you're going to have. If you don't have that, how are you going to be successful? Are you just going to get in there and pitch your ante into the pot and let the poker gods decide w what cards you're going to get and go, oh, I started with two pair here. I, I, I got uh, threes and eights, <laughs> you know, and I'm just going to bet the whole lot. Well, what's the problem? Two pairs, that's a good good hand, right? What's the probability that somebody is, is, has a better pair or will get a better pair if you're playing, playing Texas Hold'em, for example? You don't bet two pair in Texas Hold'em when you got a guy on the other side of the table pushing, a, a, pushing an ad into you, a raise. You throw them away. But what's the rule? Why would you throw them away? What if you had aces and kings? You might not throw them away. You might want to go with it. I, I, I don't know what to tell you, but be very careful. Sit down and think for yourself. God, you, watch these. I, I watch the videos that you're watching. I watch them. And you know what it cost me? To believe that they had the right scoop? Because I believe the real estate people when they were doing that. I believe the karate people when I was learning karate 55 years ago. I, I, I believe the people that were teaching me how to sail. I believe the guy that was teaching me how to play classical guitar. I became good at all those things because the people that were doing it knew how to present the material to teach it. So I figured, well, that must be the case in currency trading too. And it's not. It cost me $40,000. And that wasn't too long ago. I mean, I've been studying the currency markets since 2007. It's 2022 now. But I spent, I don't know, eight, seven or eight years doing, doing my, my currency uh, work as an academic exercise because of my physics and math and, and computer science background, um, writing simulations, uh, studying price movements, and doing all kinds of stuff like that. I wasn't doing it to trade. I was doing it as a, as a an academic exercise, and I, and I thought, well, gee, that, you know, this looks pretty good. I, I think I can do this. I've read all these books. I, you know, here's all these books. Look at all these. But these are all currency and and, and trading related books. I read all these books. I watched hundreds of videos. I got this. I know how to do this. These people are telling me what to do. Forty thousand dollars later, I go. They don't know what they're doing. What what happened? I threw all that shit out. I had $5,000 left in my account. And I just I quit trading <clears throat> for two weeks. Just totally disgusted with myself. And I thought about it. Go, let's look at this as a software engineering problem, for Christ's sakes. Let's, let, let, let's do what I know how to do, which is solve complex problems instead of what, obviously, what all these people have taught, taught me about. And I knew the statistics at the time, 90% of the traders lose 90% of their money in 90 days. That was me. Why did that happen? Am I stupid? No, I'm not stupid. 
Was I reckless? No. Well, what was it then? It was the education. Okay, let's throw the education away. Let's look at it the way I know how to do education and let's solve this problem. So I took the $5,000 and I think it was four and a half months, I almost doubled it. I was within a few hundred dollars doubling it. And I thought, well, okay, that's great. Now, I got that and I realized that I could do that on a $5,000 account, trading five minutes. But I wasn't real sure I could do that on a $50,000 account, trading five fulls because of the emotional impact of it, which most people, they don't want to hear about that. If you haven't read Mark Douglas's book, Trading in the Zone, you have no business hitting bid ask. You have no business with anything more than a $1,000 or two or $3,000 account because you're, you're going to go to the wood because you don't understand it. Because you're going to start to think that you're pretty good with that $2,000 account. And somewhere along the line, you're going to end up selling your truck or whatever it is. And you're going to end up with $20,000. And you're going to go, whoo, I can do this. I'm going to get 400% a year on my account because that's what I was able to do on my little too many counts. And what's going to happen is you're going to lose $20,000. That's what's going to happen. All the information that you need is out there. I am not going to tell you anything new. I'm just going to arrange it into a structured framework. That's the difference. If you want to trade, if you want to trade currencies, find somebody that knows how to do that. Pay them whatever they want to, uh, whatever they want for their skills, and learn that stuff. Because whatever you pay somebody to learn, what do you want to do? You want to trade a three thousand dollar account for the rest of your life? No, you're not getting into that. You're getting into it to trade a thirty thousand dollar account. If you could make 20% on a $30,000 account, 20%, you could make 50%, 60%. You know, I think I'm up, uh, what am I up, 18% for the year or 19% for the year so far. And I didn't even trade the first two months because I was in a carry trade. So I've only been carry, uh, trading for two months, 18% in two months. And I had a couple of pretty big losses in there uh, too. Um, so is that going to continue? I mean, I don't know. That's, you know, I'm on track 18% divided by two is nine, 90% uh, for the year. I, I don't know. I, that that remains to be seen. I made 31% on my risk um, uh, last year, for example. And I took some horrendous losses in the beginning because I was still working through the mechanics of, 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 of what I was doing after overcoming that huge loss before. So in looking at the uh, landscape for currency education, you really have to be able to step back from that and look realistically at, at, what, at, at what's going on. And you have to be able to differentiate the difference between a strategy and the rules that encompass that strategy because the rules are the tactics. Okay, you have strategy and you have tactics. You got to understand that if you've played poker or backgammon or chess. That's one of the things I, I ask people if they contact me and they're wondering if, uh, if I can help them. I send them a student questionnaire form. And do you play, have you experience with chess, poker, uh, backgammon, go? Um, are you a, a visual thinker? Are you a quantitative thinker? You know, have you traded a, a real account before? I ask you questions about you because that's going to determine how I would approach teaching you because we all learn differently. I understand that. <laughs> Most people don't understand that people learn differently. The, the biggest difference is are you a visual learner or are you a quantitative learner? So, barring all that, the fact that you at least fill out that questionnaire form, whether you train with me or not, is really immaterial. And I don't encourage people to train with me because it's a lot of money. And uh, it's a lot of money because it cost me $40,000 to learn it. So if you want to spend $40,000 to learn it, you could probably be successful like I am. But that's fine. I, it, it doesn't matter to me. I'm retired. I retired a millionaire from, from my, my uh, real estate investments. I don't need your money. And I don't need to spend 20 hours a week working with people I have to drag across the finish line. I want to work with people who aggressively attack this stuff 
and they understand that the money that they're spending is an investment so that they can get a, a $30,000 account. And maybe that first year, they're just going to make 20% on that $30,000 when they finally get the $30,000 and hopefully working toward a $300,000 account. So they could really trade that and make some big money. You make 300 bucks a pip. So you're going to make 20% on that $30,000. That's $6,000. You're not even paying me $6,000. To, 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 to teach you how to do it. Where, where can you earn your money back from any business in the first year? Net of all, all the expenses and all the other stuff. It takes years and years and years when you open a business in, in order to come to a point where the money is um, net to you. You go to college and you spend, I don't know, if you're at a state school, you might spend eight or 10,000 bucks a year, yeah? Uh, my daughter went to a private school. It was forty thousand dollars. I think it's forty-eight thousand dollars a year now. Um, so let's say it's fifty thousand dollars that you're going to uh, your education. That's two hundred thousand dollars for the four years. It's just two hundred thousand dollars you're investing your education in order to be an English, uh, get a bachelor's in English or a bachelor's in computer science or or you know another couple of years you get a, a law degree. Um, you got $200,000 and you're going to go out and you're going to earn what as a starting person? $60,000, $70,000? It's going to take you three years anyway before you can just make, make back what your investment was. Three years. And that is, that's just, you've made that money, but you've, let's say you make um, $50,000 a year. Keep it, keep it simple. You, you make as much a year as it costs you a year to go to school. But of that 50,000, you've got student debt to pay back, all right? You've got, um, and, 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 and I ended up at a Parent PLUS loan at 8.5%. God, if you have kids, don't ever go into a Parent PLUS loan at 8.5% with a 10-year payback. Uh, her thing was uh, $60,000 I was paying on um, is a thousand, but just short of a thousand bucks a month. A thousand bucks a month. Oh, I sold one of my buildings and one of the first checks I wrote was $60,000. Pay that shit off. So um, you make $50,000 and you're spending, um, oh, you got to be spending four or $500 a month for food. You're going to be spending um, $500 a month for your car because that's the average car payment. Lease payment is $450 a month. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta get around. You gotta have, you gotta have nice wheels. You got clothes. You got medical expense. You know how much medical insurance is gonna cost you, man. By the time you get done paying your taxes on that fifty thousand and just your basic living costs, you got nothing. So you're not paying that. It'll take you ten years to pay that uh, that student loan off. It will. Because that's what the pay down, pay down period is. And if you don't if you get a $30,000 job and you're trying to pay a $200,000 student debt down, you're screwed. It ain't going to happen. Yeah, you're hel helping the, the world with your social services degree or your uh, wildlife management degree, but you're making $30,000, $40,000 a year. Now, it's going to cost you that and then some to live. Where, where are you going to get the money to pay that down? And that interest just adds up. You know, at 8%, <laughs> you double, if you do an 8%, um, um, uh, well, say the interest was only 7%, you divide that into 72. It's called the rule of 72. Is how long at a certain percentage will it take to double your money? It's 7% into 72 is, is 10. And so uh, it'll take you 10 years to double your money at 7%. So over the 10-year payback period, you're more than doubling the amount of money that you had. Uh, the 200000 has now become $370,000. This is scary stuff. So if you want to cheap your way through this and buy a couple of books in somebody's $200 or $300 or $400 or course, or God, you can go to Udemy and get... 16 videos and two manuals and, uh, you know, um, for 
they're just going to teach you what a pip is and how to size your bank and what a moving average is and the difference between an EMA and an SMA. You really want to even pay forty nine fifty for that? Come on. See, I don't teach any of that stuff. Um, you go to some of my videos and stuff and you get the topics that are on the, those videos. That's the kind of stuff I teach. I don't teach, I don't teach you beginners. I teach a beginner how to get through the beginner stage without paying me hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Because when you are actually taking the training from me, when I'm telling you something, it ain't about sizing your account. Well, it's up to you as to what you want. Look, there's a lot of people out there that are tra uh, sell you a course. Uh, most of them are in that $500 range. Go take it. Spend the $500. See how you do it. I hope you find a good one. I've taken courses. Um, a lot of them are good. Most of them might not be so good for the general per person. They look good to me because I know the questions to ask. And I can see where they're answering those questions, but I don't think the normal person would be able to pick that up as to that this is an important node point for you to for you to consider. Anyway, strategy versus rules. The strategy is malleable. It, it, it consists of a methodology. And the rules, there are a, several different rules for each strategic event that you're trying to solve, strategic problem domain that you're trying to solve. So when you sit down there, do it on a piece of paper and try to solve it all out. If you've seen some of my videos, there's a video on there where it shows a chart that I drew on the, um, on the whiteboard and it breaks all that down into the component pieces through the three phases of the life cycle of a currency pair. So if you're interested, see if you can find that video, watch it. If it makes sense, drop a comment on there and, uh, and send me an email. Of course, I, you know, I'm not getting any really spammy comments right now from these trolls that are out there trying to sell their WhatsApp Bitcoin crap. I call those people out. Um, but I understand a lot of the uh, creators, uh, YouTube creators, are having tremendous problems with people leaving stupid ass comments and, and trying to uh, fake the account uh, to go to their account. It's just, it's awful. You have to be so, so careful. And if that becomes a problem with me as I become popular and people want to rip me off, I'm, I'm going to have to disable the comments. Um, so the only way to communicate with me is, is through that email address. And that, then you know you're, you're safe doing that. So um, if you ask a question in a comment, I will try to reply to it. Just make sure that you check and make absolutely certain that the little picture that's showing up on, on the person who's replying, it may look like me, it may take you to a website that looks like it could be me, but it isn't. And so you need to be able to understand the difference in those things, because I'm not going to um, be responsible if you're so gullible that you would listen to somebody pitching a Bitcoin. Oh, and my Mrs. Jane is so good with the Bitcoin, and I've had a you know a two thousand dollar a week return on my Bitcoin investment. If you believe that shit, do not email me because <laughs> I will rip your ass for being stupid. Okay, <laughs> and then I'll try to help you if you decide that you want to listen to somebody. In the meantime, the purpose of the video is to understand the difference between a strategic thought process as opposed to what you, the thought process that you go, would go through to create rules to resolve the issues within the strategic problem domain that you're trying to solve. Peter Rose, along with Currency Trading, have a great day and have a great trading day. And thank you for your uh, good comments about me having coffee because I'm back to my coffee.